Hi, this is Irina. Welcome back. If you see me for the first time, I am a historian and history teacher with a small YouTube channel where I talk about either Norse culture or Germanic languages. If you find either of these topics interesting, please feel free to um, go a little bit through my videos. I made some playlists as well and subscribe if you feel like I deserve it. Um, all right, so today I'm going to briefly outline to you the main difference between the soul as a concept in our Christian or at least Christian influenced worldview and um, what the soul might have meant for um, Vikings, for the Viking mentality. Um, so this is just one of the few examples of um, the fact that the soul, as we might think of it, um, could have meant different things in different cultures. But because we are very much influenced by this idea of, um, of a dual um, nature of the human being, so the corporeal and the extracorporeal, the spiritual um, aspects of um, human nature, um, we also tend to find or try to find this, um, this supernatural dimension um, when we refer to other mythologies as well, um, although this might not be the case. So, for example, with the references we have in Old Norse literature and sometimes also in archaeology, um, the image uh, of the soul, the Old Norse, uh, so the Vikings might have had, um, would have differed quite significantly from the uh, Christian one. So it was not as simple as, you know, you have some sort of um, some sort of um, spirit that could overcome death and then went to um, uh, the dimension um, and continued living on in the afterlife. It was not really that simple. Um, in Viking religion, the human um, also appears to have some sort of extracorporeal projection, but this was much more complicated um, than the Christian soul and had many dimensions. Um, these projections um, in Viking beliefs seem to have had their own attributes. So if, we, if you read Old Norse literature and mythological poems, you are going to come across several concepts, um, and I'm going to briefly outline what, um, uh, what these are. So first you're going to come across the concept of the filgia, um, which is um, yeah, translated as either a follower or a fetcher. Um, these filgur in the plural are mostly women, actually I think they're exclusively um, women or female, um, and they appear very often in dreams, um, especially to those gifted with second sight, and um, they usually take up some animal form, although you can recognize their human nature um, with the help of some characteristics such as um, the eyes, the human eyes. And um, they seem to be uh, detached somehow from, from the human and um, attached to a family line. Um, they can be inherited, in other words, but they could also reject somebody they considered uh, to be unworthy. Um, they can move on after death. Um, so um, maybe it was some kind of supernatural protective ancestress coming up in dreams and giving you warnings regarding uh, future events. So this was one possibility. Then you're also going to find the concept of Hamingya, um, which is the personified luck. Um, it's the spirit of good fortune uh, and this could have also been inherited uh, or transferred um, inside or outside of a family. Uh, it could have also deserted somebody um, or returned to someone. And um, you are going to find this idea that um, a successful person is somebody with a good hamingya, so somebody with, with luck, essentially. And um, kings and chieftains seem to have been people with a particular um, amount of hamingya or with a particular uh, strong hamingya. Well, in Icelandic nowadays, hamingyusamur 
uh, actually means happy. So the idea of, of happiness and luck seem to have also been interconnected. Um, if you also look in other um, areas, in other languages, for example, you're going to find in German Glück, which can mean both luck and happiness. So these two concepts seem to have been um, related from, um, from very old uh, times. All right. Um, the third concept you're going to often find in Old Norse literature is the idea of hammer. Um, hammer meaning the shape or the shell of a person, um, the physical form with all the aspects, but um, it goes a little bit beyond what we understand as a body, as a physical body, because it can also be transformed, so it can also be uh, fluid. Um, you have the expression skip the hon, for example, which means to, to um, shift the shape. Uh, that's why we have all these characters, these sh um, shape shifters um, in, uh, in literature and with a little bit of a hint in other sources as well that's the, that, that it might have had something to do with um, um, Odin's ability to perform sorcery as well and to, to influence uh, people with, with magic. We have the famous uh, Berserker and the uh, Ulfernar, so people uh, turning into bears or wolves in, um, in a battle frenzy. This is the most common example. Um, so yeah, it's basically a restructuring of the self and the attempt of the self to become um, something else. Um, there is also the idea that if this shell, if this shape was destroyed, then the physical body would have been destroyed too. So it's the it's really the closest thing we have to um, the physicality of the human nature. Um, all right. Now, the fourth and, um, yeah, let's say, uh, most common concept we find related to the soul or, the, or as a part of a soul, what, what we can interpret as a part of the soul, um, is maybe the most relevant one. Um, that's the concept of Hügel. Um, Hügel, which is also one of the names um, of um, one of Odin's ravens, so Hugin, um, it's often translated as Thought, although hygge means a little more than that, um, it can also mean wish or personhood. Um, so it has this, um, this idea of um, something that's happening inside of you. So um, your inner person, your inner feelings and thoughts and emotions and characteristics uh, coming up um, um, together in this concept of hygge. It was some kind of like an aura. Um, it could also travel, um, for example, to give um, to give warnings, um, exactly like the um, filgia I mentioned um, earlier. Um, and there were those gifted who could actually see this aura of yours uh, as well. So we have examples of sorcerers who um, travel and they leave behind not only their shell, the hammer, they also leave behind their hygge. Um, this is also alluded to in the poem uh, Hovamol, the sayings of the high one, where um, Odin, for example, says that he knows a spell um, to cause witches to lose their minds um, and their bodies as well, so both hygge and, uh, and hammer. And um, Hogar is also mentioned in, in some other contexts in the same poem. Um, for example, um, it says at some point that it is, um, it is alone with itself and close to the heart. So this, yeah, this could be a reference to um, this, this inner experience of the world, but we, we don't really um, fully grasp the difference between the heart and the self and this Hugger, so it, yeah, might have comprised um, the whole experience um, of of the soul. Um, anyway, um, well, there is also the idea of aftergangar or draugar, um, pretty much Viking zombies. Um, you will find them a lot in literature. Um, they appear in most contexts to be quite evil uh, troublemakers. Um, and um, you can identify them by, um, you know, the fact that they look like the living person, 
but then they have all these um, yeah mon monstrous characteristics um, such as them being bloated and um, everything that happens to a body after um, after death and they come to haunt you um, if they're discontent or they just um, sit around their uh, their burial mounds and this brings about other problems, um, which um, and some of which revolve around this idea of what goes into the goes further into the afterlife. Which part of the soul is it? The hugger? Um, is it the filgia? Is it the whole person with these with all these aspects I mentioned before? So um, that's a bit um, a bit unclear. What is the difference between um, the breath of life? and uh, the renewable uh, soul yeah, in the afterlife. So this appears to be very, very blurred. <clears throat> right, and um, you know, uh, magic as well as a concept um, often found under the name of Seder in, um, um, in almost religion um, is based on exactly this idea that there are different separable aspects of the human soul because some of them could have uh, been assigned with different uh, tasks so they would have had to leave the body somehow in one form or the other so some, some kind of astral uh, projections um, all right other than that we also have a lot of references to um, helping spirits uh, belonging to a person um, we um, can also find parallels um, in uh, Somi religion, so the religion of uh, the people who um, inhabited um, Scandinavia before um, the Germanic peoples came here, um, and a lot of terminology which again um, comprises a lot of controversy as well. So for example we have the term uh, Gander, um, which can be used in the sense of magic, wand or spirit, um, so we have, for example, um, in the uh, poem Voluspo, um, the um, uh, saying of the prophetess, where we have this long conversa conversation between Odin and um, a Volva, uh, a prophetess, um, she says at some point, it is said at some point that she conjured up um, spirit, Vitihun Ganda. So um, it's unclear of whether she conjured up spirits or whether she conjured up something using, um, using a wand, a, a staff, or maybe both things, conjuring spirits with a staff. Um, the term Sporganda also comes up in the poem, so um, the spirits of prophecy, um, which would actually make sense because if you look at the whole poem, um, it does have um, this um, very prevalent idea of spirits, um, prophecies coming together and Odin gaining access to superior knowledge thanks to these spirits of, um, of prophecy. Um, this can also be linked with the term Gandus as interpreted in uh, the work Historia Norvegiae, um, where there is of course a Norwegian author interpreting what he sees going on at the Somi people, so we don't really know if he understood what he uh, was, uh, you know, writing about. But anyway, he uh, terms it in the sense that um, there are unclean spirits helping the um, Finnish shamans um, predict future events, among other things, and uh, they also travel in uh, the snowshoes and um, transfigurate themselves. So, um, yeah, this idea of shape-shifting shape um, is also prevalent, uh, and so on. So in, in Voluspo, we also have a hint to that, a hint to the fact that the seeress, the prophetess, may be speaking to, uh, to herself um, or to a helping spirit. Um, you know, um, there is also the possibility that there are actually two prophetesses uh, speaking in the poem, um, one being the, the one who teaches Odin and the other one being um, um, the one who um, has access to all this mysterious knowledge and uh, prophecies and so on, and they, she just passes on information to the um, uh, teaching one. Yeah, so um, 
a lot of uh, mystery going on here. It uh, depends pretty much on how you translate the poem as well um, and these very complicated terms in Old Norse. So this idea about the um, helping spirit comes, for example, from the um, uh, from the translation of Ursula Tronke, but there are other possibilities as well. So just interpreting these uh, gandir as mere uh, staffs to invoke um, some kind of spirit. Um, yeah, and this uh, this word gander we can also find with the sense of um, monster, uh, wolf, or in the more general sense of monster. So think just about Jormungand, for example, the world serpent, um, or there are there are also other terms in poetry, for example, um, halar gander, yeah, the um, um, whole wolves. So there might be something of a connection um, with this about these animal um, animal spirits. Um, which can be summoned with a so-called gondul staff. Um, these are not the only ones. We also have, for example, a reference to Verdir, um, who are apparently other spirits summoned by a chance known as Vardlokur. Uh, we have this reference from the saga of Eric uh, the Red, yeah, among other things. So, yeah, as you can see, there is a lot going on in terms of the spiritual world here and um, in terms of the different aspects of human spirituality. Um, but I think one important point to take out of um, all this um, is the fact that um, th uh, the nature of it was much more complex. Um, and although we do have in Old Norse a word for soul, which is um, sol, um, imported uh, after the time of the conversion, um, it, it's still very different um, before the conversion. So you can't really make parallels between the Christian mentality and the Old Norse mentality. We have to kind of give up uh, the idea of finding something that would truly correspond to the um, Viking, Old Viking concept. Um, and then there is also the uh, problem of the sources, yes, because many sources are just um, literary ones. It, it's hard to make out um, what they um, might have thought only using archaeological sources. Um, so that might be a problem as um, as well. But that's not to say that we should dismiss what is written in um, in the sagas or uh, or elsewhere, because yeah, for the time being, it's the best uh, we have at our uh, at our disposal. Um, yeah, all right, so um, that was it from me today. I will try to develop more of these ideas in the upcoming videos, um, generally about um, yeah, religion in the Old Norse world and about the soul. I also want to make a video about um, magic staffs. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, um, a warm welcome to my channel and please like and subscribe. I also have a TikTok page, so you might want to check that out too. Thanks a lot for watching and listening to me. Have a great day and um, take care of your soul, no matter how you perceive it or um, imagine it. All the best.